Um, we have this midterm tonight. Um, my goal for today is rather than doing new stuff, I'm just going to review. Um, I would prefer if you have specific things you want me to go over, you ask me about them. But I can just remind you of everything we've done if you want, although it's a little hard to fit that in an hour. Yeah. Yeah, you Can we start the whole requesting for questions? If you want. Sure. You want me to do it by example or you just give me some words? Okay, so um, so let's, I'm just going to make up one I haven't done before. So R equals say theta times the cosine of two theta. Okay? So if we look at this polar graph, we want to figure out what it looks like. Just like if you're plotting a rectangular graph, what do you do? You figure out masses and mins, you, and you plot, you essentially plot points, but you plot points in an intelligent manner. You plot points by finding important points rather than just randomly picking things and saying, gee, where's this go? I don't know. So what we want to do here is essentially plot points in a smart way. So let me just, for this one, just for simplicity, just say theta is only positive. If theta is negative, that also will affect it, but let's just start with theta positive. Okay, so important points here. So these will be places where the thing changes direction or where it's zero. The zero is an easy place to find. So when it's zero, it's going to be different than when it's not zero. So when r is zero, well that would mean that theta times the cosine of 3 theta is zero. So that means theta is zero, or the cosine of three theta is zero. So the cosine of three theta is zero when? Well, that's the same thing at three theta is some multiple of pi over two, because the cosine is zero whenever we're at pi over two or negative pi over two. So that means that theta is some multiple of pi over 6. So that already tells us a fair amount of information. Uh, where should I start making the graph? Doesn't matter. So it tells us that at 0 and every multiple of pi over 6, the thing comes through the origin. And that might be enough for you to figure out what the graph looks like already. I don't know. Is it clear to people what the graph looks like already? Yes, no, maybe? Okay. And so let's analyze a little further. Between these points when it's zero, it's going to be positive and then negative and then positive and then negative and so on. Right? So we can look for, so if you want, at its maximum and at its minimum, and that will be, well, so we could take the derivative, or we could just realize by a little bit of analysis that we know what the cosine looks like. And multiplying it by theta is not going to change it that much except stretch it. So the maximum, so, so the max min of cosine is going to occur when the sine is zero. Right? So the sine of 3 theta is 0. So this halfway between these points. And multiplying it by theta is not going to change that very much. 
So, so here, so just by thinking a little bit, or if you want, you can take the derivative, set it to zero, and see when the derivative is zero. I don't want to do that because it'll take longer, but the derivative is easy. It's uh, cosine 3 theta plus theta sine, or plus 3 theta sine 2 theta, but whatever. Um, so let's start making the graph here. So it's, we already see it's important to know that it starts here at the origin when theta is 0. And then as theta increases, r will increase <coughs> until theta equals pi over 6. And at pi over 6, so that's, so I guess I have divide this into thirds. So this is pi over 6. I'll call it 2 pi over 6, which is also pi over 3. This is 3 pi over 6, which is also called pi over 2, and so on. In each one of these little sectors, what happens? The cosine increases, and then it decreases. And when I multiply it by theta, since theta is a positive number, it increases a little less because theta is less than 1, but then a little more. So I'll get a loop like that when theta is pi over 6, just from the cosine going up and down again. Is this clear? Okay. So now in this next region here, between pi over 6 and 2 pi over 6, the cosine increases and decreases, but it's negative. And when I multiply by theta, which is a positive number, this will increase and decrease, but it'll be negative. So in some sense, we want it to go here, but it's negative, so it goes back here. And it'll be longer than this loop because I'm multiplying by theta, which is bigger here than it is there. Right? Yes? No? Okay. And then we just continue in this way. Then, when we go between 2 pi over 6 and 3 pi over 6, the cosine is positive because that's a cosine between 2 pi over 3 and whatever it is. I, I lost that. Anyway, the cosine will be positive again. It will grow and shrink. So we'll get a slightly bigger loop. And then in this next region between here and here, so this is supposed to be tangent here. In this next region, we divide this into thirds between here and here. Well, the cosine of three times this angle is negative. I'm multiplying by theta, which makes it bigger. So I will get a slightly bigger loop down here. And then I will get a bigger loop up here. And then I will get a negative loop here, which is even bigger. And then I'll get a loop here, which is bigger. And it just continues in this way with bigger and bigger loops. So it's like a spiral of loops. So let me just draw it a little more quickly. It goes bigger and bigger loops like that forever. So this is a pretty crappy picture, but I think you get the idea. And this process is the same for pretty much any polar graph. The point, what I want you to take away from in terms of these polar graphs is not, well, let's see, I know that cosine 2 theta is a four-leafed rose and that sine theta is a circle and blah, blah, blah. That's not really useful information. Yeah? I want you to be able to understand the relationship between the equation and the graph. If this were a smaller class, I might ask you to actually graph in polar coordinates. It's very difficult to grade student graphs. Student-generated graphs, or anybody, you know, I mean, it's a little hard for you to tell whether that's the right graph or not, even if you know what the right graph looks like. So, it would be like asking you to draw a picture. Some people are good at drawing, some people are not good at drawing. It's hard to tell whether you have the idea. 
So practically asking you to produce a graph can happen in a class like this. But you should understand if I show you a graph, whether it's right, and you should also be able to, if I give you an equation and ask you something about it, be able to answer in a sensible manner. So for example, if I ask you to find the area of the largest loop between theta equals 0 and theta equals 2 pi, that requires you to understand the graph, but not actually produce it. Okay. So I, I'm not going to ask you to draw graphs. But I will ask you questions that may require you to understand the graph. OK. More polar issues? Yeah. OK. Um, do you want me to find the area of one of these loops? Or something else? Yeah. OK. Which one do you want? The largest, the largest one. OK. So which one is the largest one? The last one. The last one. Right. So the last one will be from theta equals, uh, well, the, the highest value will be 2 pi. And this, I mean, there is no last one because bigger than 2 pi is just a bigger loop. But the last one between 0 and 2 pi is a well-defined constant. So, so, okay, so. I could also ask you to find the area of the whole thing. But that would be mean because there's a whole bunch of separate calculations here. So, find area of largest loop from, and maybe I can't even do this integral. Well, it's parts. Okay. From, uh, so let me just write, let me say, instead of say, find area, write an integral for the area of the largest loop for r equals theta cosine 3 theta with theta between 0 and 2 pi. Okay, so the largest one is the last one. So is for theta less than 2 pi and bigger than 2 pi minus pi over 6, whatever that is. Uh, 9 pi over, no, whatever 2 pi minus pi over 6 is. Uh, minus, yeah, right? So that, I guess that's 11 pi over 6. So that's what the largest loop is. Um, and so now we need to think about what represents the area. Let me draw the picture not correctly, just so that it's bigger. So we have this loop that looks kind of like that. And I want to find the area as it goes from 11 pi over 6 to 2 pi. And our area consists of adding up a bunch of little wedges like this. So that means it's going to be an integral from 11, 11 pi over 6. It's hard to write 11 pi. You can't even cross the 11. Um, 11 pi over 6 to 2 pi. And the area of one of these little wedges is related to pi r squared. You can either remember that the part that I want is uh, r squared, one half r squared, or we can calculate it. So, I mean, you can remember that this is one half f of theta. Well, f of theta is right there. So my r is theta cosine 3 theta squared d theta. So this is really 1 half r squared. 
And the reason it's one half r squared is instead of having a whole circle, which would be pi r squared for two pi radians, I only have a d theta from the circle. So I want d theta over two pi is the fraction. Right, I want instead of two pi radians, I want d theta of that. So I want it's upside down. Okay. So the two pi, I want d theta over two pi pi r squared. That's where this quantity comes from, and the pi is canceled with the d theta. Okay, so I can do this integral if you want, but it will take an extra five minutes. It is, you square it out, you integrate by parts, and then you use the cosine squared formula, which is the half angle formula to turn it into uh, one half, you know, that thing. Let me not do that, because that will take another five minutes that I don't want to do. Inside? No, I'm saying that you get a R with the R with the cosine integration. So you have the base loop in the first I don't understand your question. If I put the two on the inside, it's still the same. The biggest loop is the last loop because this theta makes the loops bigger and bigger as theta grows. But if you were one over theta. Oh, if it one over theta, then of course the first the first one would be the biggest. Yeah. Yeah. You said theta over two, so that is just half. <laughs> oh, what? Was there a question related to this? <clears throat> okay. So let's move along. Um, more questions related to polar? Okay, questions related to other stuff. Yeah. Okay, so, so the general idea in work problems, so work is force times the distance that you apply, right? So this is the piece of, of physics that we need in order to do this, and then once we have this, we can turn this into math instead of worrying about specific physics. So if the question is work to pump water out of a tank or whatever it is, you want to just do a work to pump water out of a tank problem or give you the general sentence? Oh, actually, huh? Just do one? Okay. So let's say that we have, I don't know, a conical tank, you want a cone tank, you want a different shape, I don't care what shape it is. That's fine. And let's say that it is 10 meters high, and the radius at the top is 3, 5, I don't care, 2, 2, okay? So it's 2 meters radius at the top. And the tank is, do we want it to be full, half full, I don't care? Half full, okay? So the tank is half full of water. Do we have a spout on the top or does it just come right off the top? I'm not even saying that there'll be one of these problems on the test because you need to know how to do these problems. Maybe there's one of these problems on the test. So asking will there be a spout on the test is a stupid question. Yeah. Do you want a spout? Okay, how long should the spout be? Give me a number. Three. Okay, so there's a spout here, three meters long, and then the water comes out. Okay, so what do we need to do? We need to calculate the amount of work, which means we need to calculate the force that we need to lift a little bit of this water all the way to the top and its distance. So we're going to set this up. Let's let H be the height from the ground or wherever it is that the water is sitting. 
And so, and then what we need to do, if there were just somehow just floating in the air a little tiny slab of water. Oh, I guess I also need some things. I need some more constants. So more constants I need. Um, I don't remember the density of water. I guess it's a thousand kilograms per meter. Maybe it's not water, maybe it's molasses. So it's 2,000 kilograms per meter per cubic meter is the density of molasses. Okay, so we have some, it's not water, now it's molasses. Um, or maybe it's, okay, so it's a big party and this is Guinness Stout. So, which has a density of 2,000 kilograms per meter, and you have a bunch of very thirsty people down here. Um, and the constant, the gravitational constant is 9.8 meters per second squared. And everything is in meters or kilograms, so we don't have to worry about adjusting units. Okay, so now we want to pump this out. So what we need to know is how much work does it take to take a little bit of water of some little height dh, how much does it take to get it out? So if we have a little bit of, 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 of Guinness at height h, we need to know several things. We need to know the mass. at height h, and then the distance, so it's the mass times the gravitational constant, this is the force needed, and then the distance that we need to apply that force for, which is from here to here. So that will be 13 minus h, because to the very top here is height 13. Yeah. Then, then this will be, so this is the mass at h, and it has to travel 13 minus h. If you prefer, you could use, let's let another letter uh, t for from top be this distance, then this would be t, and this distance would be 13 minus t. So you have two things that add to 13, and you can choose which one you want to be from the top and the bottom. So here, let's let this be h. And then this here is 13 minus h. Okay? Would you prefer it started from the top? I don't care. Okay, so we have to know the mass at a given height h, and then the distance it has to travel here is 13 minus h. And you could set it up using the mass of 13 minus h and the distance is t, or 13 minus t and t. It's the same. Okay? And so now we need to figure out the mass at a given height. Well, the mass at a given height is going to be the volume at the given height. Times a thousand. Times a thousand. Right? So this is the volume at the given height h times the density. 2,000 times g, which is 9.8, and the distance we already have is 13 minus h. So now we need to turn this into figuring out what the volume is at the height h. So again, I'm just going to draw less of this, and I'm going to put the central line in. So this is 2, and this distance is 10. And we have a little triangle here of height h, and its radius is r, and we have a similar triangle. 2 is to 10 as r is to h. And I want to solve for r in terms of h because the volume here is pi r squared dh. So I need to know r in terms of h. So that means that R is H 
over 5 in this case. So that means that the volume at height h is pi h over 5 squared dh. Because it's a little cylindrical slab of radius h over 5. And so now the integral to do the work is pretty easy. We integrate this quantity, pi h squared over 25 times 2,000 times 9.8 times 13 minus h dh. So that's the integral we do. And what does h vary from? Well, it goes from the very bottom of the tank, where the volume is zero, to halfway up, which is 5 meters. And so that's the integral we have to do, um, which is easy. So if you want to do it, you don't, you stop. Notice that you could also, if you prefer, we could go from, uh, what is 13 minus 5? 8? Yeah. From 8 to 13, pi 13 minus t squared over 25, 2,000, 9.8 t. So if you prefer to measure from the top, you would want to go up, right? Someone over here. I don't know. Someone over here suggested measuring from the top. If we measure from the top, you would have to go It's the same. So these should be equal. This is just make the substitution u equals 13 minus Okay? Do you want me to do this integral? I mean, it's just multiply it out, plug in. So is this all right? And, and all of the work problems are of this nature. You figure out what force you apply at a given thing and for how long you need to apply it. And you integrate force times distance. If it's a spring problem, the force is proportional. You know, it's kx. And you figure out what the force is and how long you need to apply it. If it's lifting a chain, the force is proportional to the length of chain you have to move. Well, let me let me hold that one for a minute. Yeah. They're all the same. Yes, sure. You want? Okay. So let's change this problem where the cross section is a square. So instead of being a a, a uh, cylindrical tank, it's now a pyramidal tank. What will change? All that will change is this little calculation right right here. Instead of being h squared over 25, well, the side length of the square will not be h over 5. It will be 2h over 5. And so this will be 4h squared over 25. Everything else is the same. Because the side length is a square. I mean, the, the cross section is a square. It's now a pyramidal tank. So this cross section is a square. We need to figure out its side. So the thing is exactly the same, except this volume becomes a slightly different formula. Yeah? What would you do if you had a spherical tank? It's the same. The cross section is now, so if I have a spherical tank, and we, we need to figure out what is the cross section there. So now the thing that will differ is the relationship between r and the height. Because this is like a volume of a surface of revolution. So we have the property that, well, I don't know whose R. So let's say a spherical tank of radius, what radius would you like? Three. You like three before, three is good now. So we have a spherical tank of radius three. So at a given height here, Well, we find the distance from the center, let's call that, I don't know, C, which is halfway up minus H. And this gives us a triangle 
And so c squared plus r squared, oops, sorry, c squared plus r squared equals 3 squared. And so r is 9 minus c squared square root. And so the volume at, well, c is, well, if I measure from the center, so let's, instead of having it be h here, let's bury it in the ground so that the center is halfway up. So c is the distance from the ground level. Then my volume at this height, distance c from the center, is pi 9 minus c squared. It's the same idea. It's always figure out what the cross section is, find its area. And whether the cross section is a circle or um, a square or a triangle or the head of a cat or whatever it is, it's what it is, and you just calculate the area. So I am assuming that you guys can calculate areas of simple geometric shapes. No more complicated than a triangle. So no octagon. Although you should be able to figure out an object. That's easy. Okay, rather than doing, turning this into a class on work, I want to give other things a chance because we have 20 minutes left and 20 topics still to review. Uh, but so let me comment that there is. Well, okay, go ahead. Okay, sure, that's a reasonable thing. So, so let me comment that the other class is also reviewing. So if you're free at 520, no, 520? Yes. And you know, want even more review, you can go sit in on the other lecture. Okay, error on sums of series. So we have two types of series where we can calculate error readily. We have alternating series. Well, I guess we also have geometric, we can do that, but that's, well, okay. So we have an alternating series. So in an alternating series, which looks like minus 1 to the n times some bn where b is positive, and I don't care where it starts. Um, then if we add up, so if we add up just the first m terms, this will be off from that by the last, by the first term we did not use. Right, so this is the remainder formula that says if I have an alternating series and I stop after 10 terms, then I'm off by no more than the, the absolute value of the 11th term. So that's one that we have. Another one is using the integral test. So if, if my terms a, n are positive, then the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of a n minus, if I stop at the nth term, then I'm off by no more than the integral of the tail. Uh, well, let's call this f of x. Where here, f of n. Okay? And you can also do a similar thing with the geometric series just by summing the tail. Because the geometric series, you know how to sum the tail. So, the, the index where I didn't use. I'm going to put this up in just a second. So, you probably want me to do an example. Which would you like me to do an example of? 
One where I use the integral or one where I use alternating series? Both. Let's do it all. Let's compress four weeks of class into four minutes. It's like that one minute Shakespeare thing. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's start with the alternating series. No? You want to start with one with an integral? I heard no. Don't do it! No! So how many terms of uh, minus 1 to the n over n cubed plus 8. Let's make it n to the fourth. n equals 0 to infinity. Do I need to ensure that the sum is within plus or minus 1 over 1, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay? So this is the kind of question that would be asked. So what do I do? I just take the next term and I solve for when it's less than 1 over plus or minus 1, 2, 3, 4. So I take 1 over n plus 1 to the fourth. Oh, shoot. Oh, wow. Plus 8, I want that to be less than 1 over 1, 1, 2, 3, 4. So I solve for n. So I cross multiply. Should be less than n plus 1 over 4 plus 8. So now I subtract. Uh, some big number. I take the fourth root. Uh, whatever that number is. 9, 9, 9, 2, fourth root. So, how big is that? It's just less than that. Right? Because this is less than 8, so the fourth root of 1 and 4 zeros is 10. If I subtract 8, that gives me 9. So that means n plus 1 is bigger than 10. Alright? Because it's a 4 root. So I take 10 terms. So that means that I would, well, I add 10 terms. Now for an alternating series, it's actually pretty easy. If this number is small, you can just start adding until you get to something that's smaller than your error and you stop. Is this clear? Anybody confused by this? Okay, so if we change the problem just a little bit in a different series but the same question, So if I have uh, well let's make it not alternating and I'll use just n to the fourth. Same question, but here it's not alternating, so I can't use the fact that it will be the tenth term. I have to do it slightly differently. I have to integrate. So, right, this one's alternating, this one's not. So here I need to find some number m so that the integral from m plus 1 to infinity 
of 1 over x to the fourth dx is less than 1 over 10,000. Again, uh, well, now my number is going to be a little nastier, but okay. So I do that integral. Okay, so it depends on what you want m to be. Is m the first term I don't use or the last term I do use? If m is the last term I use, then I want m plus 1. Right? I don't have to lower that. One m. It's m. Sorry. This one's m. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So, so we do this integral. We get uh, so that's x to the minus 4, so we get uh, x to the minus 3 times 3 evaluated from m to infinity. The limit as n goes to infinity of this is 0, so the infinity term is gone. So we get 1 over 3m cubed, and we want that to be less than 1 over Thousand. Probably should have done eight thousand so that I could take the cube root, but I didn't. So ten thousand should be less than three m cubed. So I don't know some number. Ten thousand over three. And I take the cube root. Bigger, so I want m bigger than that. So I don't know um, if this was so that's 10, 10 cube root of 10 thirds, cube root of 10 thirds. So that's about cube root of three, which is like two. I mean. Right, 10 thirds is 3 and change. Its cube root is slightly more than 1, which is like 1.1 1 .1 or something like that. And this is around 1. That's why we take 11. So it's similar, but not exactly the same. So, obviously, on an exam, I would choose the numbers so this arithmetic works a little easier. Uh, but, you know, this is okay. Okay? And so that means that I would add wherever it is. I would add, so I would have to take 1 plus 1 over 2 to the 4th plus 1 over 3 to the 4th plus up to 1 over 10 to the 4th. How about we do that? Okay? Other questions? We still have eight minutes left. Yeah? Isn't that what I just did? Error, remainder, same thing. So, it's remainder, and error is the difference between the sum and the remainder. I mean, I mean the sum and what you did. So it's the same question, exactly. So, and I will not use either of the words remainder or error. I will say, how many terms do I need so that the sum is within blah, blah, blah? Yeah? Okay, so let's rephrase the question. Correct to three decimal places means that your answer, the first three places here, are right, and then this one you don't care. 
but you care a little bit because you need so that when you round it, it doesn't affect that. So the words correct, to three places are the same thing as saying to within point one, two, three, and a five. So just different ways of saying the same thing. So this one is more than this is more than correct to four places. It's not quite correct to five places because the fifth place is within one digit, but it could be off by one digit in the fifth place. Okay, other questions we can do in six minutes? We are all experts in your Auburn territory. Yeah. Probably I can do it. Brady? No. Uh, sum of 1 over k factorial, and you're supposed to say whether it converges or not? So I don't see what the question is. Does it say find the sum, or just does it converge? Okay, 1 over k factorial minus 1 over 2k. So what do you think? Well, you have the answer, so you know. So, does this converge or diverge? So, you can do this in a couple of ways. It diverges, so we can just look at it and say it diverges because this converges and this diverges. But that is not good enough for you. We can put it over a common denominator and use one of the standard tests, probably the ratio test. Okay? So if we put it over a common denominator, so this diverges. So, it's that. so let's do it this way first. It diverges because this is a number, and this diverges because it's a P series with P equal 1, or a harmonic series. But if you don't like that, you can do it other ways. Can you do it another way, or is that good enough for you? Yeah, well, okay, I'm being sloppy. So you can compare this to the series minus 1 over 2k. It's the same thing, right? So I can compare, so this part, I can compare to this part and it will diverge. But I can also put them over a common denominator and use the ratio test. I can't use the integral test, but the ratio will be the given one. So all of those will work. So let me just say in a few minutes then, in terms of tests that you want to use for checking convergence, if all of the terms are positive, then you have a choice. It's not always obvious which one is the right choice, but our choices are, see if it's geometric. See if uh, use some kind of comparison test. So if it, when I say use a comparison test, you throw away things until it looks kind of like a series you know, and then you try comparing them. Uh, you might use the ratio test. So the drawback. I guess here is it an alternating series? So if it's not alternating or geometric, which you can do immediately, 
then you might try comparison by throwing away terms until it looks like something you know, and then comparing, or taking the limit comparison. The ratio test. The drawback of this is maybe it won't look like something you know. Maybe you can't compare it. The ratio test, the drawback, maybe the ratio is 1, in which case it doesn't give you any information. You can try the integral test. The drawback of the integral test is maybe the integral is too hard. Or do stuff. So by do stuff, I mean maybe you can manipulate it into a telescoping series. Maybe you can do some algebra to make it look like something. Or just try calculating the partial sums and see what happens. You don't have any questions. Okay, other questions? Okay, so just to remind you of the topics that you need to know, you need to know how to do volumes, both with a known cross-section or volumes of revolution. Volumes of revolution are just a special case of known cross-section. You need to know how to find arc length. You need to know how to calculate work. You need to know how to Manipulate polar equations, understand their graphs, find area, you don't need to do tangent lines, you don't need to do arc length and polar. You need to know how, given a sequence, decide if it converges, that is, just take the limit and see if it's zero. The sequence is a list of numbers. Given a series, which is a sum of numbers, apply these various tests to decide if it converges. For certain series, like a geometric series, um, you might need to be able, you might need to sum them up. So you should you should definitely be able to recognize the geometric series and how to find its sum. Yeah. Oh yeah, average value. I forgot average value. Average value is fair game for the test. I just forgot to mention. It. Yeah. Is power series on the test? Power series is on the test. So only determining interval of convergence not manipulating one power series to be another. So what we did on Friday, not necessarily, only what we did the first 10 minutes of Monday. So interval of convergence is on the test. And in fact, I can tell you, it is on the test. What about work? I said work. Pumping out water. Either pumping out water or springs or something work like is fair game for the test. Well, there's a chain first practice test. I can take the two. I can take the two.
Sure.